of what is out in us. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. And this is real. This is the way it's going to happen because the Bible says that. I titled it Victory in Jesus because at the end of chapter 19, we will see the victory that is promised throughout all the Bible. All, back, all the way back in the Old Testament, you find it talking about this very thing. And it's victory that is coming to us and to the world, those that will receive Jesus Christ. Now, the next event in our lives or in those that are living maybe even in the dead ones, is going to be the rapture of the church. Amen. It's going to take. He's going to take us out, folks. The church. That's why it's so important that people come to know Jesus. You probably have friends that need to hear about this, your Savior. Don't hold back. Let them know what you stand for. It's the victory that we enjoy that they need to know about, and we are the ones to tell. But the rapture is coming. And right after that rapture, we're taken up to meet the Lord in the air. And I believe we'll go to that judgment seat of Christ. And what that is a judgment, not of our sins, but of the works we have or have not done for God. That's why I see it so urgent that we try to reach the lost. is to be able to show them that this is coming. It's going to happen as sure as we're here today. And we need to tell them. But that tribulation will be seven long years. It's going to be terrible. It's going to be those that will lose their lives, those that will be struck, those that will receive that mark of the beast. And that's terrible to think about. That that is not from God. That's from the devil. That's from the false prophet and the, the man of sin. And that's what we're wanting to look at is to see all this. Now, those taken up in the rapture are going to be saved people. That's the ones that have said yes to Jesus Christ. Yes, Lord, come into my heart and save me from my sin. I have walked in sin. But as Jimmy saying, he looked beyond my faults and he saw my need. Listen, there's no need in all this world that can compare to that need of knowing the Savior. Because that has to do with eternity. And that eternity is forever. And it's going to touch all people, either those left behind that will have to go through this tribulation, or those who are going to rise up to meet him in the air, in the clouds. Isn't that something? What a God we have. What a Savior we have. What a Lord we have. We have to look to him. I'm afraid in our day and time, people are going about their own business, they're living maybe what they feel like good lives. But how does that rate with God? Think about that. Next, the next thing that's going to happen will be the marriage supper of the, of the Lamb. That's where we are called the church, the bride of Christ. And we will attend to that supper because that is what God has planned for each and every one of us. Now, like I say, the church is the bride of Christ. We are in the family of God. We are the ones that he has chosen. You know what? Let me say this. I didn't choose him. He chose me before the foundation of the earth. I am one of his because when he offered, I said yes. But still and all, he had already planned for me to be in his family, in his heaven, living forever. Sometimes I think people can't hardly grasp that. What would it be like? to live in heaven, to be there with him, to see fellow Christians, loved ones. What will that be like? It won't be like it is today because we have sickness, we have pains, we have all types of things. We have those that are killing each other. Not in heaven, folks. That will not happen up there. That's why it's so urgent. That's why it's so good to get our hearts right with Jesus and where we'll be with him. And the Bible says, that he will lead us. He's preparing a place for us. That's forever. That's all through eternity. I can't say that enough. It really sticks to my heart. Now we get to the verse 11 there, and that was a kind of a background. Verse 11 says about the one riding on the white horse. Now, who is this rider? 
He is called faithful and true. This writer is the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's one we've studied about all of our lives. Sunday school, church. That's one that we have learned about. That is the one that's going to lead. He's going to come back and claim his world. You know who's behind him? We are. Because what I was wanting to, uh, to show you there is uh, verse 14. There the Bible says, And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. You know that song we sing sometimes? Are you washed in the blood? I mean, that's us. We are cleansed. That's what he does for us. I know we're still in flesh. I know there's times that we falter, we fail. But still, if we know him, we have been washed in that blood. And that's what he wants us to see. It'll change our lives. When we realize this, when we get it down pat, we'll realize, I've been washed. I feel his presence. I know he lives within through the Holy Spirit. And that's what he desires that each and every one of us see. I think it's so important that we do that. When he walked on the earth, and this is very important, Jesus was meek and mild. He, had, he did not come to harm any. But at this time, the one riding on the white horse, he's a warrior. He's come to make war against the, the wicked, against those that have disrupted the way he really originally set up for his world to be like. Because in the Garden of Eden, it was perfect. When he clears all this out, when we go to heaven, we're going to be just like the Garden of Eden again. There'll be no pain, no suffering. There'll be no killings. There'll not be any of that stuff. That is the victory that we're going to find in Jesus Christ. We sang that song, Oh, Victory in Jesus. And that's wonderful. I think that's so good that we realize that. Now, look at our world today. You know what goes on, uh, on out in our world. Listen to the news. Killing down here. They're killing over here. There's kill, uh, killing mom or killing grandmother. All that type of thing. God is Jesus going to bring an end to all that. He's going to stop all that when he comes. When he takes his world back. That's why he's wanting us to know. Let's look at the description of this warrior. Eyes as of a flame of fire. That is not the Jesus that walked this earth. He was meek and mild. He had many crowns. That tells us he's going to conquer his world. It's going to be his. It always has been, but he's going to bring it all back to what he originally was supposed to have been. Clothed with a vest, vesture or a robe dipped in blood. He is going to be that warrior that's going to destroy. He's going to, to bring back. The goodness. And you know, we're on them white horses right behind him. I believe that with all my heart. Because it says we were washed and clothed in fine lemon and washed white and clean. Washed. And when I said before, washed in the blood of the Lamb. That's what he's done for us. And that's what he wants to continue to do. Let me ask you a question. How many people right now whether it be family, friends, acquaintances. How many people do you know it's lost as they can be? How many people will say, yeah, I've heard that before. I heard that in Sunday school, but I, I want to live my own life. I think it's up to us. I believe that God intends us to share the gospel with a lost and dying world. It's told us to be that it should be. And out of his mouth goes a two-edged sword. Wow. That is the victory. You know, we behind him on white horses. We're not going to do fighting. He's going to conquer his world back by that sword that protrudes out of his mouth. Let me give you another thought, too, in Hebrews 4.12. There the Bible says, The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. That is the holy word. Remember in 
John, the Gospel of John, verse 1, chapter 1, says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's what he does. That's what he will do. That's what he wants for his world. If this world, if he created all things, and he created this world not to be the way it is now, he has every power and every right to take it right back to what it was in that Garden of Eden. Of course, man has a tendency in the flesh to destroy what God has tried to do. But we, the people of God, we have an obligation. We have to do the work he's given us to do. Go and tell. Reach out to others. I think we'll be held accountable if we don't do that. Because I can tell you why. When he takes us to heaven, the rapture, we go to the judgment seat of Christ. That's where rewards are handed out. That's where... God will see, what have you done for me down there? I, I, I led you to Christ. I led you to be a child of God. But what have you done for me? Have you reached out? Have you touched? Let me say this. We got a church here this morning. It's not even hardly half full. Folks, it ought to be full. And the obligation is mine and it's yours. And we need to reach out to people. We need a growing church. We need a church that truly lets the world know what we believe and what we stand for. That's called obligation. That's called what we, I believe, will be held accountable for. But we need to look to God. Look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. That's what he says. But note the armies behind the one on the white horse, led by the armies of heaven. That's us. They're on white horses. The battle is the Lord's. Now, we don't fight. It's the battle is the Lord. These behind him, white and clean, saved individuals. That's wonderful to even think and read about. Some people say, I don't believe that part. I don't believe that part. I go to heaven, and, and that is it. I, I received that place he's prepared for me, but the victory has to be won first. And that's what. We're seeing right here. No, we don't have swords, but we're on them beautiful white horses. Probably never seen a horse like these. Beautiful white horses. And we're behind him. How many people you reckon is that? Well, I did notice in this, he said he mentions armies. That's not just one army, but how many people are in heaven right now? Think about that. I've got loved ones there. I'm sure you do too. But we will all come back with him on white horses. What a day it'll be. It's a wonderful thought. It's good to look at. And it's a good desire to have for Jesus Christ, for what he's done for us. I find no scripture that says that the armies fight, but Christ himself destroys the wicked ones. And he treads down all those that are against him. That's talking about blood. That's talking about slaughter. That's talking about this one on that white horse. Not the meek and mild anymore, but the warrior that comes to take his world back. And that's what he's going to do. Let me go ahead and tell you, and I know you've heard this many, many times. This is that battle of Armageddon. That is the worst battle there ever was and ever will be. Because God is serious about his world. He's serious about his people. He's serious about those that are as lost as they can be. It should touch our hearts to know, maybe I've got a family member that don't know Jesus. It hurts me. But the thing about it is, it's up to us to go and tell. We have been commissioned. Can I say that? The most serious thing in our lives, first of all, is to know Jesus and then to live that life that he has given us to live. And that's that we are ambassadors for Christ. We are to reach out. We are to show the world truly what a wonderful God and a Savior we really have. But the question is, as we look around today, will the church do that? I mean, will we reach out that way? I would just like to ask each one 
I try to myself, invite someone to church. Invite someone to church that they can hear the word preached. They can hear these beautiful songs sung, and we can worship together. We can show the world what a wonderful God we really have. What if we don't? I think we'll be held accountable. What about those rewards? It's talking about handed out at that judgment seat of Christ. Who will get those? Those that have been faithful and true. If Jesus Christ has been faithful in his life that he lived and the way he has led, should not we as Christian people, should not we fit in that very same category? Now, it speaks there of the fowls of there. Now, this is going to be at that battle of Armageddon. The Bible says that the angel, he calls for all the vultures, all those meat eaters, if you will. And they will be destroyed, the ones on earth. And these vultures will eat the flesh. That sounds a little gory, doesn't it? But we cannot hide what God has said. This is the way it's going to happen. Do we believe God? Do we believe the Bible? The Bible says there, the wicked ones are kings, captains, mighty men, horses, and those who sit on the horses, flesh, and all men, both free and bondage, bond, small and great. That is what those vultures are going to eat up. Men that live their lives, as we see in our world today, living, I'm having a good time, but truly, what is God trying to say? He's saying there's a coming day. There's a day of revenge of the Almighty God from heaven because he's going to take his world back. And after that, there's going to be a thousand-year reign where he was set on the throne in Jerusalem, that holy city, and he will rule with a rod of iron. There will be no those against him, that type of thing, because it's going to be the righteous, those that truly know Jesus Christ. You say, where's the devil? He's not seeing this scene. You go to chapter 20. And there the Bible says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hand, hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Now, there's a lot of this stuff that we don't understand because we won't until it comes about. But the devil is put in that bottomless pit. Why not in the lake of fire with the false prophet and the other one? Why not with them? Because God's got a plan. Because there's come a time, a thousand years, he's going to turn the devil loose. And he's going to raise, he's going to raise uh, an army, and he's going to try to fight against the Lord God, the Jesus Christ. Let me read you a little bit on that. The beast was taken, the false prophet put in the lake of fire. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth. And all the fowls were filled with their flesh. And it goes on where he says that the devil was put in the bottomless pit. And he cast him in the bottomless pit. And there he uh, he stays for a thousand years. Until that thousand years should be fulfilled, after that he must be loosed. A little season. And then that little season, he's going to raise an army of the wicked. Where they come from, the Bible don't really tell us. But they are the wicked. How long will they last in the Almighty God? How long will they last in being able to fight against him? All these they mention, they will fight against him. But the one. That overall, he will destroy them. Where does the devil end up? In that lake of fire. Who's his company down there? All those that would not. Oh, I wouldn't want to think that my family, some of my family, would land down there with the devil. 
when there's only one opportunity given that a person say, I see my sin, I know I'm lost, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. That's the reason we give, a te- uh, we give an altar call every Sunday here. It's so important. Because let people know that there is a way. There is a way not to follow the ways of the devil. So let me ask you, are you sure you're saved? Most important decision a person will ever make. Do I truly know Jesus Christ? How long ago have I been saved? I'd say some of us could say many years, but are we sure? That's why we go back and we search the scriptures to see what God has to say about it. We can go our own way tomorrow, but is God in it? Is he walking with us every day, every minute? Do we feel his presence? Do you ever have a situation where you say, I don't know what to do, but I'm going to wait on the Lord? Let me tell you from experience, if you wait on the Lord, you'll find his help. But if we jump out ahead of him, it's going to be nothing but but aggravation. Who knows what can happen? So we're told, give your life to Jesus. So important. Studying this, I come up on uh, the book of Jude. There's only one chapter in the book of Jude. Verse 21 and 23, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And if some have compassion, making a difference, that's to those that are lost, that we are concerned for. And others, save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. We might have one opportunity to reach a lost soul. And if we don't, Where are they going to end up? In the fire? Will they suffer hell forever and ever? I wanted to touch on this for a moment. In this, it's mentioned, two suppers. Marriage supper of the Lamb, that will be there, taking place in heaven, that's God's people. Then you have that great supper of God taking place on the earth, and that is the destruction of all the enemies of God. Do you know one of these enemies? I know that that touches us. But it's so important. It's so important. Do you have loved ones? Is it worth letting them know just how concerned you are for them? I think it's something we all have to ponder. We have to, uh, to be a part of. Because the Bible says... Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. That's our work. That's what God is calling us to do. The day of the Lord and the earth will be purged by fire. Oh, that's, that's, that's really shaky. It really shakes you up. I know I've got friends. I know I've got even family members, not immediate family. A lot of them think they're saved. They really think that because they believe what they've been told. Can I say something? Be careful who you listen to because the devil, he's got a message out there. Be careful who you're going to listen to. Get in the book, the Bible. Let it, let it train you. Let it speak to your heart and let it guide your life. Let it lay down the right path for you because it's so easy. Us being flesh, human, we'll walk a ways on the right path and then we, we can get off that path. God says, follow me. What do you tell his disciples? Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. That's what we are. We are fishers of men. Little children. We'll be having Bible school probably sometime next month. We're going to have children in here. I felt so great last year. We had several of those little children that made, uh, they asked the Lord to come to their hearts. 
You know, and the sad world we in, we are. You never see a lot of those children again. But if they prayed and received Christ, you know where salvation comes from? Not from the preacher, not from an individual. It comes from above. God saves even little children. Praise God for that. I want to speak to those on Facebook or whatever means they're, they're picking us up. Let me tell you what I am so concerned about. If you're not saved, I'm concerned about your heart, the way that you live, and that you would turn away from Almighty God. That touches my heart. Let me lead you in the sinner's prayer. So all head bowed and all eyes closed. If there be one here in the sanctuary, if you have need of a Savior, please listen to this. But you pray, Almighty God, I've heard your word preached and taught. I've even seen into the future what's going to come. I don't want to face that. But right now, with all my heart, I confess my sin. I pray and ask, forgive me of my sins and my failures. Come into my heart and save me. And folks, if you mean that and you pray that in Jesus' name, let me assure you that you are saved. Let me assure you that you have a promise of heaven to be there with him forever. And let me close our service in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for the great love and the care you have for us. Thank you for this church and the good people that come to this church. Lord, may we all be soul winners. Because that's so important. That's the work you've given us to do. So I thank you for that. Bless each one. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our hymn of invitation is 519 as we stand together. Jesus is Savior and Lord of my life. My hope, my glory, my all. Wonderful master in joy and in strife, on him you too may call. Jesus is Lord of all, Jesus is Lord of all. Lord of my thoughts and my service each day, Jesus is Lord of all. He is the only Lord. There is none other. There's no hope in anything in this world for eternity except through Jesus Christ. If you're not sure, let us show you how to be sure. Let us show you that Jesus saves. And if you'll do that, you'll have that promise of heaven that's coming up. Blessed Redeemer, all glorious King, Worthy of reverence I pay, tribute and praises I joyfully bring to you who are life away. Jesus is Lord of all, Jesus is Lord of all, Lord of my thoughts and my service each day. Sovereign before his throne bow, give him your heart today. Jesus is Lord of all, Jesus is Lord of all, Lord of my thoughts and my service each day, Jesus is Lord of all. Amen. Would you be seated just a second? I, I got a couple of prayer requests I'd like to mention and pray for. Okay, one great plus for the church is the children's Sunday school class started this morning. Miss Debbie's teaching it, and that's a beginning. We're trying to work our way back to full time, so thank God for that.